Well, good morning and welcome. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason, your host for the day of this Farm Doc Daily webinar. Market outlook for corn and soybeans for the 2021-2022 year. Scott Irwin and Joe Jansen, agricultural economist in the College of Agricultural Consumer and Environmental Sciences are with us today. Jim Baltz is behind the scenes, making sure that everything is running very, very smoothly. Uh, we would like to thank, of course, our sponsors for the day. They include TIAA, uh, the Center for Farmland Research. That's uh, right here on campus, farmland.illinois.edu. Compere Financial, Corteva AgroSciences, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, uh, the Illinois Corn Growers, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Let's do a quick poll to get things started for the day. Here's the question. What do you expect the U.S. average farm price of corn to be for the 2021-22 growing season. That is the crop that is about or is being harvested at this point. Do you think it'll be below $4.50? This is the cash price, your cash price for corn between $4.50 and $5, between $5 and $5.50 or over $5.50 for uh, a bushel. I should say this is um, the national average cash price. So what's what's that cash price going to look like for you? Go ahead and take some time and fill that out. We'll get you the poll question answers momentarily, and then we'll be in a discussion of what this really looks like for the day. As we go through uh, the PowerPoints, uh, be sure that you uh, recall it's possible to download those and get them from the Farm Doc Daily webinar website. That's at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. And then you look in webinar for the archives. You'll find uh, the YouTube videos and, of course, the webinar. What do the answers look like for this one? Well, here they are. 6% say it'll be below $4.50. Uh, uh, the big number is between $4.50 and $5 at 54%. And between $5 and $5.50, 36%. And over 5 bucks, just 3 percent. Scott Irwin, thank you for being with us. I think you're ready to kick things off. What do you think of the results so far? Need to look at those just for a minute, just to uh, uh, see. Oh, well, you're Joe, doing some calculations there, aren't you? Very yes, nice. Yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> you're doing the ag If we wait that, I'd say we're somewhere in around that, probably that 480 number. I mean, with a little bit of a little bit of wiggle room on either side. But yep. so it looks like about the way so average. High. Yeah, high fours. Um, and, you know, uh, well, thanks a, a million as always, uh, Todd, for the wonderful uh, emceeing job you do. And Jim uh, here for making everything run smoothly. And to my partner in crime today, Joe Jansen, really appreciate him being here. So, for Eddie, we wanted to ask that. Just obviously, we're curious. But it's kind of remarkable, Joe, how close that number is to in a webinar uh, that we did a couple of weeks ago on farmland prices. They had done an independent survey of uh, farm managers and rural appraisers for their membership, and they had put in that webinar a price of 482. So that uh, looks like everybody's settling in <laughs> kind of at that high fours, Joe. That's right. And I think the, the, the open question is sort of, well, what could change between now and the end of this marketing year that kind of maybe changes that picture? It's, it's, that's it's right. Like, and that's uh, uh, what we're hopefully going to uh, help you uh, have some interesting perspective on that. So let's start, Joe, with a review of where we've been. We think that that's uh, important. Uh, this is a plot of the DEES 21 corn futures price starting all the way uh, back uh, at the beginning of the summer of 2020. And so it's very important to remember that uh, uh, basically uh, a year ago at this time, we were sitting just above 350 a bushel, uh, skyrocketed all the way this spring to almost 650. So approaching uh, a doubling of the price level in less than a year. And we've kind of been on a slow slide down uh, since those spring highs on corn, currently sitting in the futures a bit above uh, $5. Uh, and so uh, a lot of volatility there, and that's kind of gonna be a theme of what we wanna talk about today. Uh, a, a similar looking picture for soybeans, 
uh, although we probably uh, maintained the strength in soybean prices uh, a bit better than we have in corn. Again, another important theme going forward, those prices, the peak in the spring of around just below $15 and then we're sitting now uh, just a bit below $13 on the board in terms of the new crop futures price. So that's kind of where we've been, uh, where we might go. We wanna start with a recap of the USDA September crop production report. And it's important to remember uh, a couple things about the September report, uh, which was released last week, that it was the first one that included uh, surveys from both farm operators, uh, and you can see the sample size on that for that report, but also their objective yield survey numbers. Uh, and also uh, to add to the fun, uh, they took into account the FSA certified acreage data so that they could adjust the planted and harvested acreage estimates from the June acreage report. So all sorts of fun there. My final comment would be the USDA, this is one of the USDA's slides, they list the satellite uh, remote sensing as another data source. Uh, I find that honestly just a tad bit on the confusing side because it, it appears that no one exactly knows how much they rely on that data. It's an indicator they look at, it's been added as a featured indicator in recent years, but my impression is it's still supplemental and it's, it's very much secondary to the um, ag yield and the objective yield data. So just uh, a few thoughts on that. So here's a quick recap on what the USDA reported uh, in that September crop production uh, report. Uh, planted acreage for corn uh, went up a half a million acres, uh, and that turned into a harvested acreage uh, increase of 600,000 acres. That was certainly less than I expected based on FSA data that interestingly enough, had been inadvertently leaked to the marketplace uh, a couple of days before the crop production report was released last Friday. Uh, so that was a bit of a surprise to me. I thought that corn acreage uh, was going to be up at least a million acres, but it wasn't. Um, the yield, uh, National average yield came in at 176.3 or up 1.7 bushels per acre. Um, again, that was very close to market expectations. So that put total production uh, of corn in the September report at just slightly below 15 billion bushels. I think the key number then for the entire net of all those is that basically, um, the USDA's corn production estimate is up about 250 million bushels between August and September. And just to know where I lean, uh, I think by the time we get to January, uh, as you'll see in a minute, I think that we're probably going to see um, uh, all of those numbers go up further. On soybeans, uh, also, very much to my surprise, based on that early peak at the FSA SEP numbers, um, acreage was down, uh, planted acreage estimate went down 400,000. I expected it to go up a few hundred thousand. So the USDA, always full of surprises. Uh, yield went up uh, six tenths of a bushel. The net of all that was basically no change in the USDA's uh, soybean production estimate for. 2021. So that's what the report showed. Now what I want to do is go into uh, a little bit more detail about uh, where the yield uh, increases came from in that report. Here's the USDA's uh, chart on uh, changes in the yield estimates from August to the September report. 
So here, blue is up, uh, gray is no change, and red is down. And so you can see that uh, corn yields uh, were up between August and September almost everywhere in the country, continuing to see uh, a string of record yields um, throughout the Eastern Corn Belt. Um, a small decline, but still a record yield in Ohio. Uh, to me, what I found really interesting in terms of the numbers were more what went on in the Western Corn Belt. A uh, lot of talk about the impact of dry weather, which it clearly was dry up until early August out there in the West and upper Midwest. And we saw that it looks like in August, the uh, farm operator uh, estimates that the USDA primarily relied on probably, you know, undershot yields just a little bit. Uh, the yield in Iowa was up 2.6 percent, Wisconsin 3. Uh, look at Minnesota was up almost 5 percent. Um, and even North Dakota, which has been at the heart of the extreme dryness, it was up uh, almost uh, 2 percent, Nebraska up 1%, no change in North Dakota. So uh, that's what's been, was really driving the increase in the corn yield in, in the report. Soybeans, uh, a little bit different story. Again, um, netting out to not a big increase in the yield. Uh, once again, uh, Iowa and Minnesota uh, kind of led the way in the increases in the soybean yield estimates. Uh, but some big, uh, fairly substantial decreases in South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. Uh, so that's how we got there. So now I want to switch to uh, what those numbers mean uh, for the 21-22 uh, balance sheet for corn and soybeans. So we're going to take a bit of a quick tour through that. Um, First two columns are historical data. Uh, the SEP WASD uh, 2021 numbers are in the third column, and uh, uh, the 21 22 uh, SEP WASD numbers are in the uh, fourth column. And then what our Joe and I's numbers are in the last column in blue. What we want to keep an eye on is that yellow row, row which is the ending stocks numbers. Uh, the latest estimates, which uh, uh, Joe and I are in agreement with for ending stocks and the year that just finished, um, uh, 1.187 billion bushels uh, gives us a stocks to use ratio of 7.9%. And a season average price of 445. Uh, the new crop numbers for the just started 21-22 marketing year, um, we can see the acreage and yield numbers feeding into giving us a total supply of 16.2 billion. And then you can see the USDA use numbers. Um, we think a key number that we're going to be talking a lot about today is that export number. Um, giving us total use, the USDA 14.8 billion, giving us ending stocks estimates of 1.408 billion, a stocks to use ratio of 9.5%, and the USDA used a five uh, $5.45 season average price. So where do we come out? Like I had indicated uh, a couple of slides ago, uh, we see area planted and harvested drifting up uh, just a little bit further, maybe a half a million acres by the time we get to January, uh, a bit higher yield. So we think we're going to go over 15 billion bushel crop, giving us a bit higher total supply when all things shake out. Um, right now, we're just going to take the USDA uh, feed and residual and export numbers as being uh, uh, estimates that we agree with. Exports are certainly interesting. I don't want to steal any of Joe's thunder, but basically um, 
on the positive side, uh, corn exports has gotten off to a good, uh, robust start. History suggests that that 2.475 billion number is solid right now, uh, but we're a, a little skeptical of that number uh, based on what could happen with uh, exports to China. You know, basically the story on U.S. exports for corn this year is we all know that they're going to come down from 27.45, but Joe, how much is the key? That's, that's exactly right. Um, we there's a, a whole host of sort of uncertainties, especially like you said regarding China. We'll get into that um, in just a minute, uh, but definitely not the banner year that we had last year, and not sort of a big out of the blue surprise that caused corn prices to rally during the marketing year like they did. Right, and so with our assumptions on supply and taking the USDA uh, numbers on use, we get an ending stock number of uh, of fifteen sixty three. So kind of interesting. Uh, puts us over that kind of magic uh, 1.5 billion bushel figure in in our estimates and a stocks to use ratio of 10.6%. And then we get to the big show, which is, well, what does all that mean for price? And um, I'm going to go through some real detail on that uh, here in the next few slides. Uh, but we're throwing out a number of Five dollars, and I think it's safe to say, Joe and I won't be surprised if the it actually turns out lower than that, based on the analysis I'm going to show you. And intriguingly enough, our audience seems to agree with that, Joe. That's right. Um, yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to take you through a little uh, some new material on the way we are thinking about that critical relationship between. Uh, the price of corn, season average price of cash price for corn, and that stocks to use uh, ratio that we put here in percentage. So what you see here are the scatter of data points from 0708 through 2019-20. That's the last year on this chart. Of uh, you know what does that relationship look like between stocks to use and the price of corn? And if you look at that, it doesn't take you long to see that there seems to be a very different pricing behavior in the corn market uh, above or below roughly 10% stocks to use ratio. Um, we see a pretty flat relationship uh, when we're above 10%, and then it's much steeper when we get someplace in that nine ten percent uh, level, this actually makes a lot of sense economically, because when we're above ten percent, we the market is basically saying we have adequate stocks to cushion against any kind of normal supply or demand shock. But once you get below that nine ten percent level, basically you don't have much uh, in the way of stocks to cushion any shocks to uh, current consumption or, or use. And therefore, um, the market, uh, the relationship becomes much more price insensitive, the way economists talk about that, or price inelastic. So this is one way to capture that. There's lots of different ways. And I've certainly been, uh, uh, looked at it different ways in the past. We, uh, Daryl Good and I have had a series of Farm.Daily articles over the years trying to get to uh, the best way to think about this relationship empirically. And so this is my current best take. Uh, uh, Joe may not fully buy into this, but I like to think about, you know, we kind of have a high demand and low demand pricing relationships um, when we're above 10%, represented by the green and red lines. And those show a, uh, a relatively flat relationship between price and uh, the stocks to use ratio. But then again, when we pass that, get below 10%, we have a completely separate relationship uh, that gets very steeply sloped. And that's why we get really high prices for not really that much lower stocks to use ratios. So that's 
the way we're currently thinking about it. So you have a pretty good fitting relationships for uh, low demand and the high demand. We don't have too many years there. 2013-14 um, is going to turn out to be a key uh, year as we look forward uh, and just kind of keep these numbers in mind. In 13-14, the ending stocks to use ratio was 9.2% and the season average price was 446. Okay, right. keep those numbers in mind. And the important thing here is just sort of understanding where is that point in the market where all of a sudden, what was sort of a non-event becomes a huge event that really starts to move price. Exactly, well said, Joe, well said. So now I'm just gonna add to that and take off some of the detail for 2021, and 2122 uh, based on the USDA numbers. So we see 2020, 21, uh, that ended up being uh, basically an ending stocks of 8% and 445. So that really kind of fits on that high demand line pretty well uh, because that was kind of a transition year. It took us a while to realize that stocks were going to be that low. Yeah, and I think the one maybe difference, and this is something we'll talk about in just a minute, is how that Chinese import demand came in really kind of, you know, in the middle of that marketing year. And so some of those, some of that season average price was prices that occurred, you know, pricing that happened during the growing season and into September, uh, October, November, before prices really took off. Right. And so, you know, and even th th this calculated price includes forward contract prices that were at those, you know, $3 levels. And so that's part of why that looks um, maybe like a low price for that ending stocks number. So if we had the uh, Chinese buying more front loaded, maybe it would be more on that uh, magenta line. Yep. So now when we look at where, you know, the key thing is where are we at uh, looking forward from for the 21-22? And so the, the uh, observation for the current marketing year uh, is that it's nine and a half percent based on the USDA's projections and 545. And, you know, you know there's only four data points to fit, fit that uh, magenta line. So, you know, that's, I would say, consistent with history in that kind of pricing regime. Um, and our point is not to say that the USDA is flat wrong at this point, but our message is, we are really into right there in that um, ending stocks and use territory where you can fall off basically pricing off of the uh, magenta line or pink line and all of a sudden you find yourself pricing off the green line and hopefully not the red line. That's right. Well, and so it, yeah, it could be a, it's a slide down. The, the, so the, the downside is it's a steep slide down, but when you kind of hit that floor, hopefully there's something underpinning the market at you know, price levels that aren't too low. Right. <laughs> and so that's why we were so much lower, and I, I think our listeners were as well, that uh, you know, the, the, our point is not that that uh, USDA is wrong, uh, but that we're in a territory where there is, in fact, a lot of downside price risk at the levels of uh, just small changes in, uh, in particular increases in ending stocks mm -hmm. can really slide you down to, you know, a 450 price is not out of the question in the fundamental territory that we're in in the corn market right now. And so that's our message. Exactly. Okay, quick look at soybeans. Uh, before I chew up all our time, Joe. Uh, uh, basically, in soybeans, uh, only difference from the 21-22 SEP WASDI numbers that we think that the soybean yield is probably going to drift up a little bit, uh, giving us uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, 20, 2021 soybean crop and slightly uh, larger uh, ending stocks. Uh, we're having our estimate right now, 217 million bushels, 4.9%. 
stocks to use ratio and we think that 1290 price is solid based on that relationship and boy there is a wild card sitting out here in the soybean complex that we would really be remiss if we didn't talk about for a couple minutes uh, and that is what uh, we're calling the renewable diesel boom uh, don't have kind of time to get into a lot of detail on that uh, but renewable diesel is a biomass based diesel uh, produced from um, vegetable oil and uh, animal fats. And uh, for various reasons, we are in a building boom for renewable diesel in the US, and it's actually global. Uh, that is very comparable, I believe, to the ethanol boom in the mid-2000s. And this is a chart showing um, uh, under construction and planned uh, projects. Uh, this is from Goldman Sachs. It's a year old now. I just threw it up there. They had 3.3 billion gallons. Um, I've seen recent estimates that this number could be as big as five or six billion gallons of added capacity in North America alone. I just saw today an announcement for a huge plant by Shell in Rotterdam. So this is a big wild card in the soybean complex. Uh, just to give you just a little perspective on what this means. Each billion gallons of um, renewable diesel production takes something on the order of 8.5 billion pounds of feedstock. 8.5 billion pounds. The entire soybean oil production in the U.S. for 21-22 is estimated to be 25 billion gallons. I mean... Most people don't think all this capacity can get built because we literally don't have enough feedstock for it. Um, and how much this boom is impacting pricing dynamics, I think is most dramatically shown on this chart, which shows the value in terms of dollar per bushel of soybean oil versus soybean meal. So this is the crush value. So you're multiplying prices by the amount of meal and oil you get from a bushel of soybeans. Traditionally, meal was roughly two thirds of the value of crushing soybeans. And so meal drove soybean prices and drove the uh, pricing in the sector. And look what's happened, uh, basically almost all in 2021, we now have the oil value equivalent to soybean meal, basically 50%, 50%. That maybe doesn't sound like such a big deal, but that's an extraordinary event. And it's something that we're really gonna be working on in the farm doc team and uh, something really big to pay attention to as uh, we go into the future. And with that, I'm, I'm finally done and you're on deck, Joe. All right, thanks a lot, Scott. Um, so before we get started, we're just going to think a little bit about, um, spend the rest of our time talking about uh, U.S. exports for corn and soybeans. Uh, we talked a little bit already about how uh, last year the big story was China's uh, import demand for U.S. for U.S. corn. Uh, that was about 25 million metric tons or 900 million bushels. I just wanted to talk about what do you expect uh, for U.S. corn exports to China? Uh, way lower, slightly lower. Uh, a little bit bigger, or maybe way bigger than we saw uh, in in the last marketing year. Just as a reminder to the folks, Joe, that uh, if they're doing something else, there is a poll question up right now, and we'd like you to fill that out. Uh, you're doing a pretty good job, uh, 600 million bushels, uh, below 600 million bushels. What do you expect for corn exports to China? And uh, there are four particular answers there. Go ahead and read through them, and you can... Uh, I'll pick yours out and we'll show you the answers here momentarily. Okay, Joe, back to you. We've almost gotten to 70%. We're getting close. That's about where we try to get things turned around. Uh, and that's probably as close as we're going to get. Sounds there good. we go. All right. So it looks like about two thirds 
uh, saying that we're sort of maybe slightly lower, drifting lower. That's kind of the consensus with the, the USDA numbers. Um, but there is some optimism out there that we could see uh, even higher uh, U.S. exports for corn to China, 24% uh, of you saying between 900 and 1,200 million bushels. Um, and we could sort of talk about, what we may, I think there are, there are some reasons to say maybe maybe that, that optimism is justified, and we'll sort of talk about that here. So uh, just recapping sort of where we've come from, what was last year like? It was a strong year uh, for corn and soybean exports. Um, this These charts just break down um, U.S. corn and soybean exports by destination. Uh, so over the last uh, six years, we've seen kind of uh, a drop off in, in exports, both for corn and soybeans during that trade war period, 2018, 19, 2019, 20, we saw sort of a, a reversal of trend, lower exports for both crops. Uh, and then last year we came on like a ton of bricks, um, record exports uh, for corn, a high, a high level of exports uh, for soybeans. And uh, the big story there was the red bars. So we saw 22 and a half million metric tons of US uh, corn exports to China. Um, that is sort of unprecedented in, in, in the recent past. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for why that happened. Um, but uh, this I think is the big source of, of price optimism. Uh, for a couple of reasons, one just because, say, for soybeans, uh, exports are half of half of use. So whatever happens here is going to have a big impact on price. For corn, it's kind of the one place where we can see dramatic growth, like we did last year. Um, the ethanol number, there's sort of limited, you know, capacity maybe to expand U.S. ethanol use, limited capacity for for uh, expanded U.S. feed use, uh, but we can we can see dramatic swings in exports. Um, China as an importer is pretty crucial to this picture. Last year, we were marveling at this surge that was happening through the fall. Um, that hasn't gone away, China as a, as a source of import demand, but I think the situation and outlook have changed. And so one thing we wanna to do today is just sort of assess some of the uncertainty, the opportunity and risk uh, that exists here in export markets. Um, to do that, we're gonna sort of compare, compare where we're at um, with export sales to date um, relative to the WASD projected levels. So that's the number that Scott showed um, in his US, um, US corn and soybean balance sheets. So that, that WASD forecast level um, given here in metric tons, because we're going to do everything uh, in international units. Uh, that's the way USDA does it. Um, that WASD forecast level right now is about 63, 64 million metric tons for corn. Um, the red line here shows the current export pace, where we're at now as we sit at week two of the current marketing year. So we're just sort of starting. Uh, we have uh, sales on the books. That's why that mark current marketing year level is as high as it is, about 24 million metric tons. Um, that is relatively high compared to the, the pace over the previous five years. And recognizing that that previous five-year average, the green line, is the average of some pretty great years for U.S. corn export sales and also some relatively poor ones, I thought, thinking about 2018 and 2019. Um, so we're at about 20, we're sort of well above uh, the, the sort of average pace. A lot of that came from a big jump in export sales that happened in May. So back in May, we saw uh, a huge surge in new crop export sales. A lot of that was to China. Um, uh, the bulk of that big move um, early in the marketing year, sort of 16, 18 weeks before the start of the marketing year, was China uh, coming into the market and putting sales on the books. China is about 50% of where we're at right now, and that's more than... Uh, more than they were last year in terms of last year's total exports. So the kind of the, the question here is, is what we've seen from China all we're going to get? Um, if it's not, and we see this sort of thing, and we project the current level out following the five-year uh, average trend, we get to a number that's maybe slightly above the current USDA projection, but still below what we saw last year. Um, however, uh, the downside risk is, China's already put a significant amount of sales uh, on the books, and how much are they going to sort of continue that as we go go through the fall? 
on for soybeans, uh, much closer to um, sort of a typical uh, pace over the last five years. Um, where if we project out where we're at in this current marketing year, um, we see uh, something pretty close to what the USDA forecast is. USDA forecast is slightly above that five-year average. And if we and that's sort of where the pace is at as of right now. Uh, the big difference here is that export sales to China are only about 45% uh, of current sales. Uh, and if we look at sort of what's typical, um, US, the US uh, typically export US exports are typically 60% China and 40% other countries. So the big sort of open question here is as we get into the crucial part of the soybean export sales period, we see that that line is the, the export sales pace is pretty steep over the next few months, over the first sort of 20 weeks of the marketing year. That's when we've got to make the bulk of our sales. Um, China needs to come into this market in a pretty significant way to get to sort of where they typically are in terms of a share of US export sales if we want to get to that that WASD, uh, WASD projected level. So um, right now, they're about 45% of current sales. Uh, they were 58% last year. That's sort of pretty typical. Uh, we, uh, we need to see that to get to the WASD forecast export level for soybeans. Okay, Thinking about China specifically, because I think they're the, the big part of this picture, Chinese import demand and sort of how it, it works differs between corn and soybeans. Um, so a little bit of history here to kind of help us understand the current world supply and demand situation. If we look at consumption and production in China, we can see that um, China has historically tried to match uh, production and consumption for corn. Uh, there was a period between 2011 and 2017 where they really, uh, there was a strong concerted effort to boost corn production and corn production actually exceeded consumption over that period. Since 2017, uh, production growth has slowed or stopped um, for corn in China, uh, but consumption has kept growing. Um, part of that is um, there is this demand for animal, for, for animal protein and thus for, for feedstocks. Uh, so whether that's soybean meal or corn, um, there's been an effort to address that feed demand by 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 boosting production for corn, but not for soybeans. So you have this big gap in production in consumption and production for soybeans. That gap is much smaller for corn, and it's possible that Chinese production can be a significant part of sort of closing that gap. That's what we saw, uh, what we see with the most recent projections. We do see. Chinese corn production growing um, for 21-22. Um, part of that growth um, is uh, coming from a higher acreage for corn production and also a rebound in yield. And I'll talk a little bit about those numbers specifically. But China, it, part of sort of why we're not going to see export sales where they were in 2020 uh, is in part a, a rebound in, in Chinese corn production. Uh, for soybeans, the gap just sort of continues to grow, and I think the U.S. will comprise uh, a share, a part of uh, the uh, the ability of exporters to sort of close that gap between production and consumption um, in China. So where does this leave um, U.S. export prospects for 2021, 20, 2022? Uh, these tables just show uh, a sort of abridged version of the world corn and supply uh, balance sheet, uh, highlighting some of the key uh, key exporting countries and key importing countries. I've highlighted the export and import numbers here in red. Um, so we can so on the corn side, uh, the United States is the world's biggest exporter, uh, but Argentina, Brazil, and Ukraine are all major players uh, in that market. Uh, on the import side, uh, Japan and Mexico have historically been sort of the biggest customers. Uh, for U.S. corn exports, and China is coming in. USDA has uh, current uh, marketing year imports for ch for China for corn at about 26 million metric tons. Um, interestingly, they've kept that number relatively constant um, over the last few months, uh, but that production number has moved up significantly. 
Um, that production number is now at 273 million metric tons. Part of that is a, a boost in acreage in China, and part of that is a return uh, to trendline yields. So yields over the last four, four, four or five years in China have been at or below trend, and that 273 number is the result of sort of returning to uh, a trend line, sort of long run trend line yield for corn in China. Uh, if the Chinese corn crop gets bigger, I think the, the risk is that that number uh, goes up even more. Um, in the most recent WASDI, USDA boosted ending stocks for corn and kept the import number the same. I think there's a significant, I mean, obviously the Chinese corn ending stock number is a bit of a, a, a a loose target uh, <laughs> is maybe a saying it politically uh, diplomatic answer. A there, diplomatic Joe. answer, um, but the uh, but you would think if Ch if Chinese production grows, some of that could come uh, could could come out of uh, come out of imports, and that's the sort of the real threat um, on uh, on on imports in China. The other thing that's happening here. Uh, is a rebound in corn production in Ukraine. So you'll notice corn, Ukraine produces about is going to produce about 39 million metric tons of uh, of corn this year. Uh, that's something that'll sort of get solidified more. We're moving into the production uh, into the harvest season for corn in Ukraine um, right now. Uh, all the vast majority of that is exported. Um, last year, the big one of the big reasons why the U.S. exported so much corn to China was a, a collapse in the U Ukrainian corn crop. Uh, their export number collapsed. They are coming back into the market in a big way um, this year, uh, and so that ex there there is stiff competition in international markets uh, for corn. Um, on the soybean side, uh, I've cut, there's maybe a little bit less to say there, um, other than I mean the big story is China. Chinese imports are more than half. Uh, of global imports, so they import about they're they're projected to import about 101 million metric tons uh, in this coming marketing year. Total world imports are about 171 million metric tons. Um, so obviously, China is sort of the the most of the game uh, when it comes to exports. The United States is projected to capture a, a sort of typical share of. Of that, about half of our production will go to exports, and and will capture us likely capture a significant um, portion of that Chinese market. The caveat being sort of how much does China source from the United States before the Brazilian crop uh, comes online, and Brazil's sort of planting beans, planting beans right now. Um, so I see sort of as we sort of go forward, a couple of sort of I think kind of things that kind of maybe give me a little bit of caution. One is that Ukrainian export number on corn. And the other thing is sort of what we think about for uh, the Brazil soybean crop. Uh, that's not something that I think we get a lot of news on in the next couple of months. That's something that's sort of maybe more into November, December, January uh, going forward. So okay. with that, we'll leave yeah. it there. If you have questions for Joe Jansen or Scott Irwin, go ahead and put them in the question box and we'll get them answered momentarily. We would like to take this time to thank our sponsors, by the way. They include TIAA, the Center for Farmland Research here on campus at farmland.illinois.edu. Compere Financial, Corteva AgriSciences, FS Growmark, uh, the Illinois Corn Growers, Farm Credit Illinois, the Gardner Agricultural Policy Program, the Illinois Soybean Association, and of course, the College of Agricultural, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, Department of ACE, Agricultural and Consumer Economics. Some upcoming items next week, we'll talk about Brazil and the United States. This webinar will focus on how uh, farmers in those countries compared to each other. Joanna Colusi will be here along with Gary Schnitke. And then the following week, I think this one should be really pretty interesting. Marty Williams and Aaron Hager, uh, both from USDA ARS uh, and uh, Crop Sciences. Um, Aaron's in Crop Sciences and Marty is in USDA ARS and Crop Sciences. We'll talk about uh, changing weather patterns, those bigger rainfall events and what it means for weeds 
in fields and how that impacts yield going forward. They've been able to do some data mining over about 30 or 40 years worth of data and uh, some interesting things to talk about. That'll be two weeks uh, from now on September the 30th. Let's move on to some of the questions that we have at the moment. I think we'll begin with the scatter chart uh, question, Scott. Um, they want to know if you developed a scatter chart uh, for soybeans like you did for corn uh, and what observations you can draw from that particular diagram? A great question. Uh, I anticipated that that would happen, and I was thinking maybe I should put uh, that slide in at the end or look at it. The, the relationships are not as neat in soybeans as they are in corn, but the same basic ideas hold um, is the way I would put that. And my plan is to uh, write some Farm Doc Daily articles in the future uh, on that topics. The way I would put this uh, for those, it sounds like this person that uh, answered the questions is uh, uh, really interested in the details of modeling. If you look at the old work that uh, Daryl Good and I did about five years ago on this question, I think, um, we were explaining all of that price variation that you saw on the corn chart uh, with technically what would be considered intercept shifts in the line. And moving the line up and down. Yep, there, thank you, John. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, my the evolution in my thinking is that it's better to think about um, explaining the scatter with a combination of intercept or moving the line up and down and then another separate line that's completely different that has a, a, a much steeper slope and different intercept that's the idea uh, and i'll be addressing that in some uh, farm doc daily articles uh maybe this uh later this fall this winter maybe i can drag joe into helping me on those <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Joe, here's a question uh, about Chinese corn import projections. Um, mm -hmm. Do they account for any changes in trade policy, for instance, increasing the TRQ? Yeah. Um, so China has a tariff rate quota uh, for corn uh, of about 7.2 million metric tons. Obviously, that's a level that's far lower than sort of current projections for Chinese exports. The administration of that tariff rate quota um, is sort of a, an open question. The United States took China to the WTO over the administration of that quota, saying that they weren't, they weren't administering it fairly, uh, and the US wasn't getting enough exports to China. Obviously, last year kind of threw all of that <laughs> out the window, because we ex the United States exported far more than 7.2 million metric tons of corn to China. I, I guess the the way that I sort of see that trade policy bit as, as a source of future uncertainty, uh, that you know, for whatever reason, if China wanted to, they could administer that TRQ in a way that would dramatically reduce US exports. Obviously, we have more exports uh, on the books for this current marketing year than uh than are accounted for in that tariff rate quota. Um so I sort of see that as just maybe a source of future uncertainty, but it, it's not something that's going to come into play and bind. Obviously, there's a bigger question. We also got a question about sort of is the is sort of this corn and soybean exports to China a result of trade war resolutions? That's uh, kind of a related question. So again, a trade policy question. Um, and I think though uh, of the the heat of the trade war has died down substantially, uh, I don't think that. The, that's a cause. That's a cause of what's happening. In part, this is a, a this is a demand story. If China needs, or anywhere in the world needs, uh, needs corn and soybeans, one place that they're going to look is to the United States. Um, it's the you know to if China is goal is to fulfill their targets under that uh, under that trade war agreement, um, they can't do it all just buying corn and soybeans. There's just not enough corn and soybeans in the world. They're, they need to buy other U.S. ag commodities. So it's um, it's it's a thing. Uh, it's it's a factor, but it's not sort of I think what's driving um, driving the bus here on uh, Chinese corn and soybean. I just add one thing on that. I uh, 
listened to a presentation by Seth Meyer mm. um, uh, uh, earlier uh, or last summer, and he had some super interesting comments about their journey with the TRQ versus uh, USDA's estimates of um, Chinese soy soy uh, corn imports. Excuse me. Yeah, and they felt like they. I'd, I'm. I don't want to put words in Seth's mouth, but the way I would interpret it is that they felt they were burned during the 2020-21 marketing year, where they kept early on their corn export um, to China projection. They kept at the, it at, at the, the TRQ, TRQ yeah. and that had always been their policy for many, many years. And then just all of a sudden, they just Poof. They just blew through it. No explanation. Nobody talked about it. And so uh, normally the WASD assumption is they take into account trade policies like that and that constrains all their numbers. Mm -hmm. And that had been the, and so they, the, the, China did that without explanation. So and now I know it's WASD's, uh, the World Ag Outlook Board policy is that they just, don't consider the TRQ right now for uh, Chinese corn imports from the uh, the world. And that, like you said, could maybe they'll go back to that at some point. Right. Uh, it's it's a possibility, but it's not sort of Doesn't something, seem it's not something that's obviously playing into the current projections exactly. given that 26 exactly. million. But it is a number. great question and a and and, and a, you know an important consideration to keep in mind. Uh, we have a series of questions about soybeans, in particular about renewable diesel. And just uh, so that you know, the parlance generally now is that um, biodiesel or soy diesel is um, one uh, way of making some diesel fuel. It's an additive. And then there's renewable diesel, which is actually uh, made at the refinery, the oil refinery, that is. And it is simply a one for one. It is diesel fuel, one gallon of uh, renewable diesel does not have crude oil in it, and it is just a gallon of diesel fuel. So uh, the first question uh, is, what was the current soybean feedstock number for renewable fuel? Uh, if if you actually put that one out, they say they missed it. Yes, uh, the WASD estimate in September was 11 billion pounds, down slightly from August. To give you some perspective, in just 2021, uh, that number was 8.8 .8 billion pounds. So it went from 8.8 .8 to 11 in one marketing year, reflecting the renewable diesel boom. And, you know, everyone's trying to catch up with what's going on in reality. I won't be as surprised at all if it, that drifts upward some more. And I think that's ultimately going to be the main fundamental driver that supports soybean prices probably going through the next marketing year. Then do we know how many uh, bushels or uh, of soybeans or how many gallons of renewable diesel uh, can be derived from a bushel of soybean? Yes. Okay. It takes just a little bit of conversion the way we usually think about that. Um, it I use 8.5 pounds of soybean oil per gallon of renewable diesel. So you uh, get roughly 11 pounds of soybean oil from uh, a bushel of soybeans. So you can say it takes the oil from roughly 80% um, of a bushel, uh, well, technically 77% of a bushel of soybeans to make a gallon of renewable diesel. So um, I, I hope that answers the uh, person's question. Why are soybean ending stocks so high for China at 35 million metric ton? You also listed Brazil at 28 million metric ton, Argentina at 25, uh, compared to just 5 million metric tons in the United States. Uh, so th the answer is those are just USDA's numbers um, for, for stocks. <laughs> um, explaining Chinese uh, grain stocks is... Uh, one of the dark arts, I believe. Great, of, great way of putting it. Uh, of grain market analysis. Um, and one that I don't try to dabble in too much. No. Um, the word I like to use is that uh, 
official Chinese statistics are opaque. Indeed. I think that's right. And and I think that, so we talked a little bit before about, you know, the USDA does use the the official numbers produced by the national st statistical agencies of other countries in their numbers and they try not to deviate too far from them so long as they seem plausible. Although they have had some giant revisions in the past that have caught people by surprise. Certainly. And so uh, that is, I would say, the toughest job of a commodity market analyst uh, or grain market analyst uh, these days is, in fact, um, dealing with uh, the Chinese data. Yeah, that's absolutely right, because um, it is so important to the overall supply and demand balance. Um, and if that number were to change, I mean, every number on the table sort of has to come in and adjust. Um, I think that what you'd sort of, I mean, what the big source of uncertainty there is, is, is there a big change at some point in sort of not just what that number is, because the number may be an, an arbitrary level, but uh, a dramatic re-understanding of what the stocks to use ratio picture looks like globally. And that goes back to the charts that you showed, mm -hmm. right? If we get into a point where all of a sudden we don't think we have sufficient stocks to buffer another you know, weather shock in some major producing region, um, then we can get prices moving uh, and becoming quite volatile. And in fact, it's a, just as a side note, it is one of the reasons why um, uh, we have focused on the relationship between the U.S. price of corn, which is really the global benchmark. Uh, you know, conceptually, that really should be based on global stocks. Uh, do you, um, but I think one of the reasons that are, those relationships fit so much more poorly and are less predictive is because of, uh, you know, the huge role that China plays in this estimates of the size and variability of world uh, corn stocks. Uh, same thing for soybeans. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we continue to focus in terms of predicting the U.S. price on U.S. stocks. Right. A couple of final questions. Is there any reason uh, that AFS and the Chinese swine herd will continue to play a role in the marketplace? Uh, potentially, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, there, it's, again, hard to get a good handle on uh, how serious, but they're dealing, I would say, with, um, you know, kind of continuous ongoing outbreaks. And they've made, I think, a lot of progress in terms of um, dealing with that internally, um, but it's always kind of hanging out there is the way I would put it. Yeah, that's right. I don't, yeah. That's, I think, a good way of putting it. It's an ongoing issue. Um, it, obviously, the, that the Chinese uh, pig herd is rebounding and getting larger, and that's the source, a huge source of the growth. I mean, that's why we just see, you know, soybean production in China and and corn production continue to grow year over year. Yep. Let's uh, finish up with this question: Do you track your estimates versus USDA over a period of years? And how do you do? Oh, I'm sure we're outstanding. <laughs> we live in a Lake Wobegon <laughs> world here in our heads, Todd. We're, we're always above average. <laughs> That's the way I deal with radio. It's yeah. it's fleeting. No, but, but seriously, away. we don't put out our forecasts probably regularly enough uh, to um, compare them, but we do have our balance sheets from past webinars. I, I haven't honestly tracked those versus the USDA. Maybe I'm afraid to do that, Todd. Uh, but we do have four or five years that we could go back and see how we've how we've compared uh, because they are on there in in our webinars. Um, so that they're they're in the public domain, but uh, I haven't done that systematically. It's a very good idea. We shouldn't be afraid of that. You know, there is one final question. This is about renewable diesel. Uh, and and given your answers, they were making some statement about what the cost of uh, soy diesel or diesel made 
from soybeans might be. How's it related to the RFS and, and things that are actually happening in California? Okay, we're going to switch modes here, Todd, and we're going to extend the webinar for an hour. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get past that. But <laughs> you wanted a one-minute answer. And yeah, we don't, I, we don't I, have I that. I will give you, uh, and uh, here's the quick answer. Uh, both Fame Biodiesel and S Renewable Diesel sell for slightly uh, less than the wholesale price of petroleum diesel because both Renewable Diesel and Fame Biodiesel, for technical chemical reasons, have uh, uh, slightly less. BTUs uh, or miles per gallon. And so it's uh, taking away all the subsidies, okay, that are involved in this area. And it's a witch's brew of subsidies is the only way I'm going to term it. But that, 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 that's helpful, you know, to start with is what's its value in the marketplace? A little bit less than wholesale diesel. Okay. But um, that's without all of the policy values attached. And so both Fame Biodiesel and Renewable Diesel um, uh, have two additional sources of value uh, in the marketplace. One is uh, RIN credit values for biomass-based diesel. Those are D4 RIN values. Uh, and then also, uh, carbon credits going in mainly, almost principally, into California under their low carbon fuel standard. And the, va the number one source is LCFS credits, and the number two is uh, renewable fuel, uh, excuse me, RFS RIN credits. Uh, but to give you an idea, the combination of those recently have put um, Fame Biodiesel and Renewable Diesel prices between six and seven dollars a gallon at the wholesale level. So that, that gives you a, just a kind of taste of how huge the subsidies are for uh, fame and renewable diesel. I think we're out well, of time. Scott Irwin, you were done. Thank you. I appreciate it, Scott. You did that quickly. Uh, and I thank you and Joe Jansen for uh, putting this webinar together today, uh, along with Jim Baltz, who's behind the scene, uh, and for everybody else who's joined us for the full hour. We appreciate this as well. Don't forget, if you've signed up for one, you're signed up for the whole series. There's a, another webinar again next week and the following week as well. And then we go all the way through the 14th of October on Thursdays at 11 o'clock. We do thank you uh, for being with us today. You have a good afternoon. I'm Illinois Extensions. Todd Gleason.